We've never had a guest come back on the show this quickly. But we manifested you getting a shot at the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. Chris Masters started out focused, but I mean, just completely lost his way. Chris Adonis is a guy who is a polished performer, a great in-ring worker. The wrestling audience, what it comes down to is they want the best wrestler in that position. They don't think that Tyrus fits the bill. It like never rains in LA. And here we are, I, I look at this big like, water spot on my shirt here is... and you're the one who wanted to schedule the interview today i'm sure we got bright clear skies the rest of the week and you I were didn't... like we must do it on this rainy tuesday i didn't look at the weather and go oh man when should we do this indoor interview well you know that you know why that is because you're canadian you're from toronto That's you guys right. deal yeah. with much worse in los Way angeles worse. we shut the town down okay when it's raining nobody and every anybody who is out drives terrible so thank it's god the worst yeah. and this tra this town doesn't drain there, like, there's just water everywhere. Yeah, it's the worst. I'm pretty much, where I live now is pretty much flooded. Every time it rains, the next morning it's flooded, and my feet are literally, I'm ankle deep in water getting to my car. So, like, <laughs> I have a whole process where, I don't, when I'm going to the gym, I set my sneakers by the door. I go out in my flip-flops that I can get wet and submerge in water, and then I back the car up, and then I change into my nice sneakers. Jeez. <laughs> so we've never had a guest come back on the show this quickly. You were just with us like two months ago, but we've also never had a guest where we talk about something happening, and then two months later, it's actually happening. We made this happen. We manifested you getting a shot at the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship and now it's happening. It's going to be you versus Tyrus. Yeah. You know, Chris, I mean, quite frankly, we spoke it into an existence. Yeah. And a, a lot of people are wondering what the heck is Chris Adonis, Chris Masters doing back here. But yes, we did speak it into existence. I, and from my perspective, I feel like I've won, been one of the best wrestlers in the game for the last year. And it's just taken everybody else this long to kind of catch up. So like, I've seen this all in my head and it doesn't surprise me, but it is nice to have hard work pay off. And you know, based on our last interview that I've put everything into professional wrestling and being the best professional wrestler and to see it pay dividends in the form of a world title match with Tyrus on pay-per-view is uh, pretty cool. I feel like I have a small part in this too, because it started with, NWA tweeted, like, who should get a shot at Tyrus's championship? And I said, well, come on. I'd love to see Tyrus versus Chris Adonis. They posted, like, we'd like to see that too. And then Tyrus responded here. You responded. It all kind of came together. I kind of thought that these were just tweets. But this is actually happening. And nobody in the NWA deserves it more than you. Well, thank you. Thank you. But, uh, Chris, this is all you're doing, quite frankly. No, I mean... <laughs> But I mean, uh, I appreciate the support. I've got um, quite a few people behind me at this point in my journey, and I do appreciate that. And um, yeah, like this, like I told you in the last interview, uh, this NWA championship for me is a form of uh, kind of redemption of all the stuff that I've either messed up in the past or all the blown opportunities. This is everything I've worked my ass for, ass off for over the last couple of years. There's a lot of people that don't like Tyrus. <laughs> And there's a lot of people that don't like Tyrus as the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. Where, where do you stand on that? Well, here's the thing. What, as he calls them the trolls, what I will give him this is what the, as he would call them the trolls don't understand is Tyrus does love professional wrestling. He does have a love for it. But what he doesn't understand is the trolls, it's not, they're not woke. It's not a right or left thing. It's a professional wrestling thing. And quite frankly, the wrestling fans are resentful of a guy who comes in to or back into professional wrestling as kind of, say, a side hustle or, you know, let's put it this way. If he lost the NWA title, he'd be just fine because he'd be out there hosting Greg Gutfeld. He'd be doing his thing on Fox News. And, you know, the wrestling audience, what it comes down to is uh, – they want the best wrestler in that position, and they want the best wrestler holding the most prestigious title in professional wrestling. And quite frankly, they don't think that Tyrus fits the bill. So you declared yourself as the number one contender. You said like- I declare. Yeah, you did. Well, I saw it on The Office. You know, Steve Carell did it. So you know, what the heck? 
Might as well just come out of here and declare it. But although I will, if, in my defense, yes, I did declare it, but I had defeated Trevor Murdoch, who yeah. was the former champion. I won a teams match we had where I represented Team Rock and Roll, and uh, my body of work speaks for itself. But go ahead. So you, uh, I, that's what I was going to lead into, is like what makes you feel like you're the number one contender? Well, I mean, I felt like I was the best wrestler in NWA for a long time now. And I've every time I've gone out there, I feel like I've had to go out there and and prove myself. And, you know, I see a guy like Tyrus who now, you know, sits in his ivory tower back in New York at Fox News holding the NWA title hostage. And when I see that, I all I see is a guy, you know, using the NWA title as a prop for mm. his own personal vanity. Mm. And I'm not cool with that. And when I come in to Chicago, April the 7th, for the NWA 312 pay-per-view, I am going to be rep re representing all those trolls, representing all the wrestling fans, representing all the marks, representing all the smart marks. And how ironic is it that formerly Chris Masters, the guy who was never an internet darling, will come into Chicago, a wrestling town, if there ever was one, and will represent the wrestling audience against Big Bad Tyrus. Does this feel like a culmination of you know, 20 years so far in wrestling, and now you're getting a shot at one of the most prestigious titles in all of wrestling? It does, like because I haven't had an opportunity like this in close to 20 years. I, I broke into the business and went straight to the top and I've, you know, it trailed off and I lost my way. I lost my focus, but I regained that focus now. And uh, it does feel like a 20 year picture. I mean, I talk about the last couple of years specifically because as I told you, I came out of the pandemic, a different guy, but um, I have kind of, you know, this is my chance to get back on top. It's my chance once again in the main event. And I haven't had that opportunity in 20 years. So all the work that I put into this, yeah, like it's, it's a big deal. I'm excited about it. And like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to put it all on the line, win or lose. At the end of the night, I will shine. And the people in Chicago and all over watching the pay-per-view will be speaking of Chris Adonis. Well, Tyrus has the championship right now, but like, think of all the people that have held that very prestigious title. I do every day. Hmm. I do every day. Harley Race, Nature Boy, Ric Flair, just to name a couple. But those are two of the most influential guys in my professional wrestling career. Uh, Nature Boy, Ric Flair, obviously, being one of the goats. And Harley Race being a guy who kind of took me in right outside of WWE. I don't actually get to talk about that very much, but hmm. the first time I got released... Harley Race really took me under his wing for a good six to 12 months. I met his uh, then wife, BJ, and they really taught me the game from the independent aspect. And they let me stay at their house. And like, it was just, uh, it was an incredible experience. So when you bring up the NWA title, those are the first two that come to mind of many. We had a lot of things come out of that last conversation. Um, we talked about like, man, it would be so cool to see Hurt Lock versus Master Lock. It makes sense. Bobby Lashley was the first person to break the Master Lock. We put that video up, that little clip, and Bobby Lashley reacted to it like pretty quickly. <laughs> yes, he did. And and I just noticed today that, uh, what is it? Wyatt is out for WrestleMania. So uh, Bobby is looking for opponent. And I told Bobby under his Instagram post that I left that date open for him. So maybe How one kind day <laughs> we will get this Hurt Lock, Master Lock uh, matchup. Believe me, I'm pushing for it. But, um, you know, a couple loose ends I got to tie up there. Well, think about it. It's in L.A. It's just down the street, really, from here. I could take an Uber there. You could take an Uber there. I could drive you there. I'll, I'll drop you off at the stadium. <laughs> we'll sneak in. But, like, it, it feels like it could make a lot of sense. This is your city. Oh, well, I mean, it would be really cool, and, but it's one of those things where, um, oh my gosh, it's just so, it feels so far-fetched that it could actually happen, but like, if it did, mm. I mean, just imagine the surprise it would be. Like, let's just say he didn't have opponent, and they didn't know. Although, you know, I have a feeling they could fill that spot, obviously. They have a big talent roster, but, yeah, you know, yeah. it'd definitely be a very interesting surprise to, out of nowhere, have a Hurt Lock, Master Lock matchup, but it, it would kind of hurt to not be able to you know, properly build it either if we yeah. weren't able to do that. Cause you know, the build for that thing would be freaking great. You know, full Nelson versus full Nelson. And you know, I have so many ideas just because just based on the fact that 
he is still as big as he is, and I'm a much different wrestler. I mean, the matchup would just be completely different. It's just so interesting to me because we're sitting here. There's three of us in this room, you and I included. It feels like we're very much recording in a vacuum, mm -hmm. and then we put the full interview out you know, on YouTube and on the podcast, all those clips out. I think there was something like two or three, maybe four million viewers on all of that stuff. Combined. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Amazing. Everybody on TikTok, Instagram. I got to yes. get more active on TikTok. I know. I know. I'll tag you. <laughs> Please okay. do. Yeah. yeah. Do I mean, have... I, I, it, the functionality is a, a problem for me. I mean, I've always found Instagram much easier for me personally, but I got to get on it. It's just amazing that, like, that many people can see this. What was the kind of feedback that you got after the last interview? A lot of people just talking about how I look different and, you know, uh, I look different and a lot of props, a lot of people, it was mainly positive. It was 90% positive every once in a while you got something negative or somebody bashing you, but that's just the internet, right? You got to, sure. when you're in our positions, like you have to develop thick skin for that, or you're never going to read your comments or you're never going to post anything. But, um, it was mainly positive. I mean, when I went into the interview with you, I, just to be frank with everybody, I wanted to show everybody who I am today, which yeah. again is a completely different guy. And I wanted that to shine through in the interview. And I think it did. I think people, it was like a reintroduction to uh, Chris Masters or uh, Chris Adonis. Yeah. And like, I think that there's a lot of people who are aware of who Chris Masters is. How different is Chris Adonis? Uh, he's just so much, uh, it's just night and day. Like Chris Masters, Started out focused, but I mean, just completely lost his way and, you know, didn't prioritize uh, what he needed to and didn't focus solely on professional wrestling, his ultimate love, which is, it's always been. And now Chris Adonis is a guy who is a polished performer, a great in-ring worker, a guy that understands psychology, one of the best sellers in the business, not to completely break the third wall, but I mean, honestly, these are the things I stand by when it comes to me. So like, he's different physically, he's different mentally, he's different spiritually, he's different emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest things I can't believe we didn't hit on in the first interview. Oh, I know where you're going. Is this amazing story. Oh boy. Of saving your mom from a burning house and tearing a tree out by its roots. Take us back to the beginning of this story and set it up for us. Well, hold on. before we go there, how annoyed were you after the interview when somebody <laughs> commented and brought up that you didn't ask me about that? What, what was your... Look, you know, these interviews usually go about an hour, right? And yeah. we had an amazing conversation for, Without about, it, yeah. for about an hour that, you know, time just flew by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it ended, and I think... I think we were like standing over by the door there and I went, ah! Oh, you, oh, so you thought, okay, that's funny because I thought that that comment had actually smartened you up to it. But um, I was the same way. I was like, oh shoot, that would have been great. But you know, all right, anyways, not to prolong this anymore, but okay. So the story of my mom in and the burning. what, like nine years ago? I don't even think it was that long ago. I think we're talking 2016. Oh, I don't know. I'm bad with this. Maybe it was 2015. <laughs> Um, we have, don't worry, we have all the world's uh, information at our fingertips. It's all a blur, but... I'll look it up here. Okay, so this is how it starts. Okay. I was, I'm at Gold's Gym. I'm going to tell this as fast as I can, but oh, I don't, I don't want to limit... We've done all day. Well, we do have all day, but I don't want to limit the details, at least for uh, your show, because that's what it's kind of all about here. Okay. 2013. Oh, my March gosh. 19th, 2013. That's almost 10 years to the day. Time flies, man. Wow. Time flies, kids. Just okay. Just be aware. Um, okay. So I'm at Gold's Gym, which we both worked out at yeah. uh, just not too long ago. And um, what happened? Shoot, I received a phone call from my mom's neighbor saying that something was going on uh, at her apartment. She didn't know what, but something funny was up. So then I go to call my mom. And anytime I call my mom, I get a voicemail um, without fail. Like, you know, it'll ring, but then it'll go to a voicemail. This particular time, it just kept ringing which doesn't sound like much, but for me was a big red flag. Like, yeah. why is the answer machine not, it always goes off. So I immediately hopped in my truck and I went from Venice to West LA. It's only about 10 minutes. Thank God I was in town, by the way. And I get there and it's an odd scene. I get there and my uncle who was staying with my mom at the time is locked out. That's all I see is him at the door. So yeah. I get out of the truck and I don't know what's going on. I'm like, what is going on? And I get to the door and, you know, I'm trying, I don't even know what my uncle told me, but I start trying to make communication through the door and somebody starts speaking to me. It's a voice I don't recognize. And they are just speaking, like I'm asking about my mom. Yeah. And 
this person is like talking crazy. They're like, she's my mom too now. Whoa. And you know, we're gonna go, I don't even know what he said, something like we're gonna go to heaven together. Like it was, yeah, it was absolutely. Wow. Yeah, but it, here's the thing. So I realized within, it didn't take long for me to realize, oh, this guy's tripping on something. Like he's either tripping on meth or crack. Like he, this is not what comes out of a straight, even a crazy person's mouth. It just yeah. sounded too bizarre. So um, I had found out also too, another twist this whole thing that the cops were actually there and had left. So like, I don't know where the confusion was. Like they didn't obviously didn't know she was locked in the house, but somehow they had come by and not read the situation and left. So, um, okay. So I'm in, so I'm trying to figure out what to do and I'm looking at the door and I'm thinking about kicking it down obviously, cause there's a madman in the house with my mom. And the so, house isn't on fire yet. No. Okay. No, no fire. No, I don't even know that, that it's barricaded. You're just point. trying to get in. Yeah, and he's not letting me in. And so, like, you know, your first instinct is like, fuck this guy's, you know, I'm sure okay. it doesn't matter. And I'm going to kick the door down. Yeah. Thank God I did it. I had the, the smarts to know that, like, what if I don't get this door down? What if I can't get in? And then I escalate the situation. So, I, you know, I took a breath. I walked out to the street so he couldn't hear me, and I called the police, and I told them, hey, you know, I heard you guys were here. I need you to come back. I don't know what happened, but my mom is barricaded with a madman, and I'm about to kick the door down, and I need some help. And and does she, she doesn't know this guy at all? Well, it turns out, no, I don't know who it is initially, but it turns out he's actually uh, staying with one of the other neighbors. Oh, okay. But, like, this is a guy who's on the outs, and he's just... He's a mess, I guess, apparently. I don't know. I wasn't around there at the time except for right this instance. But yeah. uh, so where were you? So I tell the cops and then they come back. The cops are back now and they form a perimeter and they put me on the perimeter, right? And like, you know, this whole time, man, this whole thing sucks. Like your mom is, oh, and here's an important detail I left out. As I'm communicating with her through, or him through the door, I hear my mom yell something about fire. She's like speaking in code. And I can tell that she's saying that he, she's based, that he's threatening her to start a fire in there. Wow. So I already knew that much. Yeah. So and that's why I didn't also didn't kick the door down because she had said that, and it made me think he's gonna start a fire, and I can't get the door down. Then I'm screwed. What do I do? Okay. So anyways, now the cops come. They form a perimeter. I'm on that perimeter, and they start trying to communicate. Obviously, same thing. And then they start trying to get the door down. And again, this just kind of solidifies my position. They couldn't get the door down. They get the battering ram. Like it, the, a cop bigger than me with boots on, because I had like athletic shoes too. He couldn't get the door down. He kicked it three times. Then they get the battering ram. And it takes about three to four tries to get the door down. This is because the door, first of all, is very sturdy, but it's also barricaded by a ton of shit. Mm. Like just, he took whatever he could and put it in front of the door and barricaded it. But hold on a second now. <laughs> so while all this is happening, oof, this is where it gets intense. Okay. I'm, they forced me on the perimeter, right? So I'm yeah, watching yeah. this all happen. And as they're trying to get this door down in the corner window, I see a fire emanate. Oh. And so right at that moment is where everything starts for me. I'm like, oh, hell no. I spring into action because I'm just like, I'm not staying. Like I'm, because while all this is happening too, once they get the door down, like actually I'm going a little forward. Like, okay. So I see the fire. I come over there and I grab the hose. And I, I think one of the cops breaks the window and I stick the freaking hose through there. I don't even know what that was. That was probably the stupidest thing I did out of the whole exchange. But like you see a fire and you're just trying to like, you know, it's also, it's the house, it's possessions. You're trying to like, what can I do to preserve that? Sure. In addition to more importantly, save her life. But okay. So now as this is happening, I stick the hose in there for whatever reason. And I come around the corner. They've gotten the door down with the battering ram, but like smoke comes burrowing out. So the fire had already been starting for like a little bit of time elapsed between these two, you know what I mean, as far as story. But, and I see all the cops back, like they basically, they take steps back and you know, this is my mom. So I'm completely irrational. I'm like thinking in my head, what are they doing? Like she, and then, you know, like, why are they backing off? And again, we're talking about smoke burrowing. So they can't, they have no choice, but it's my mom. So I'm <laughs> completely irrational. And that's when I realized this is the moment. Once the smoke came burrowing out, I realized she might die and it's not even be from the fire. She's gonna die from the smoke. And it mm. felt, and that was the moment that it all, be, it was real the whole time, but that was the moment where the adrenaline shot through the roof and I just knew I have to save her right now. Mm. And so what I did is I knew exactly where her room was. She had two windows 
and one of the windows was blocked by a tree. So I told the cop, break these windows, break these windows. She's in this room. Because again, they can't enter because the smoke. And she breaks one, no sign of her. Now the other window is blocked by a tree. So I freaking grab the tree and I bear hug it. And I basically rip it to the ground. Like I like come go down with it. She breaks that window, nothing, nothing. All of a sudden my mom pops up. Like it almost like, I don't know. It was just like, I don't even know what to compare it to. It was just, but it was like, for me, it was like, oh my God, thank God. And I got up. I scooped her out. I brought her about 50 feet from the scene. I made sure she was okay. And then um, the last bit to this story was the next thing I know, I'm checking on her and I see them wrestling him out in front of the uh, the apartment. And I rush over there and I give like, you know, what I can only describe and what most people identify kind of as a, like almost an RKO punt to his head <laughs> when when there was an opening. <laughs> So, and that was, I mean, that's pretty much the story, you know? What wow. I mean? And like, I, and that's as detailed as I think I can get with it. I've had to tell that story a lot of times, but it's been a while. So, and this is also the perfect platform for it. So yeah, that, that, that's what happened, man. And this guy, you know, he ended up going to jail for four years. I think he's out now. And I'm pretty sure, um, I'm assuming he was on meth or something. Like, I don't know. He was really... The behavior was just so odd. I like that the exclamation point on the story is you have all this aggression, all this anger, and you punt him in the head. Oh, well, I mean, it was there. Like, it was it was that literally the only thing that was open, and the cops weren't even mad about it. It was, <laughs> it was when I tried to kick him again that they were like, yo, get the fuck out of here. Like, all right, that's enough. You got your one in. Yeah, like, I, I could, well, seriously, because the next one I didn't play so well, and I actually kind of half caught one of the cops, too. Oh. So like, you know, like, yeah, like, get the hell out of here. You got, you got your licking. How did this story end up like making its way to the news? Like, how did they, how did they find out about it? Wow. You know what? That's a really good question. I have no idea, honestly. It's not like, I don't think that was anything I did. I just know that because yeah, it was maybe two days later that I was, on I remember good, seeing it. I think it was, yeah. I was on good morning America. Yeah. Good morning America. TMZ, TMZ had it. Jay Leno made a little joke about it saying something about those oh, finally steroids in the news for a good thing. And yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty funny, but like, honestly, I don't know how it got the attention it did. And like, I didn't, I don't feel like I kind of went out of my way to publicize it. I mean, I'm sure I said something on Twitter that night or, whatever but i'm um, not thinking that like oh you know this is gonna catch well, i'm sure there was a police report and usually when there's something newsworthy that gets like sent out and maybe they put two and two together of like oh chris mordeski that's oh that's chris masters maybe maybe i don't know all i know is man the story's kind of like an adrenaline rush it's already got me like you know i'm like sweating a little <laughs> please bit. don't like, punt me in the face <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, but you know like the the standout moment once again though, like because people talked about like the adrenaline rush that you'd have to save your mom. Like yeah. again, once that smoke came burrowing out and the cops kind of had to back off, that was that moment right there, man. And like I just hope for everybody else to say that you don't have to have that moment. But like I I don't feel like anything I did was special, man. Like if it was anybody's mom and you love your mom, like you were going to have that same. I don't know if you'll be able to pull the tree out, <laughs> but you're gonna at least try. I, I think the most impressive part about this story is there's cops everywhere and who saves the day? You. <laughs> yeah, but and it's nothing against them either, man. Like I think they did their job. It's just who's going to do more than your son. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's what I, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that's also what I realized in that moment, not because they couldn't advance because of the smoke. Although like, again, I'm irrational. I'm like, get in there. Who cares <laughs> yeah, about my smoke? Mom. Yeah. But like, um, I don't even know what the what was it. I don't know. I just think the point is like they could have been like, "Hey, stand back, sir. We've oh, got this." Yo, yeah, but oh yeah, and but I would have never accepted it again. Mm -hmm. Like you know, like anybody would have done the same thing for their mom. I just don't know if they would have been able to rip the tree out of the ground. So, like, how's Mama Masters doing now? She well, uh, she unfortunately, and I think I told you this. Yeah, she had uh, she had to have a hospital stay for a few days, but she's actually back at home now, doing better, oh, resting. Yeah, she's like she's hardcore. She's a badass. You know what I mean? Like I think she's gonna. She might outlast me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is like one of the main qualities from your mom that you're so glad that you have? Mm, I just think you know. My mom has a lot of uh, resilience. Mm. She's had to battle. She has had to battle a lot. Like she has not had the perfect life. Not that anybody has. We've all had our challenges and stuff. But my mom particularly has had horrible challenges. Like, you know, her mom died of cancer at the age of 12. And like, you know, that that's 
pretty messed up, man. And, to, and then to kind of be, uh, you know, have your dad, you know, her, her dad not show her the kind of love that her mom did. And, you know, and so I think I just look at my mom's life as a whole and I, I see where she is now. And I just feel like, wow, like what a resilient woman. And wow, like she's had like she had to deal with so much negative stuff throughout her life that like I just hope that I'm able to give her a better life like any son would want to. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Like give her the the roof over her head that she wants the the food yeah. the care all of that yeah right before or right after our last interview you turned forty we were talking about like man forty oh, no. just around the corner so happy birthday ah uh, how's forty treating you oh my god this is forty I you know I feel like forty is <laughs> pretty good for me but um I don't want to sound cocky about it either but I mean honestly it because of perspective, which we talked about last time, but also just my physical health. Like I'm taking care of myself better than I did in my thirties and twenties. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't drink or anything like that. And like, I didn't even make it a point to not drink alcohol. It was just, you know, I would go out and I'd have a sip or whatever. And it just doesn't make me feel right. You know what yeah. I mean? I just feel like I'm poisoning myself. So I just, I feel like I'm in bringing on 40 in the most graceful possible way ever. And I, honestly, I feel like I'm at my best. And again, we talked about this last time. I know a lot of people always want to say like, oh, but what happened to you lost all your gains from the WWE days? But it's like, you know, like I clarified in the last interview, I was never trying to be the 280 pound stagger for tackles, you know, one dimensional big guy wrestler. I wanted to be an athlete. And that's the, the performer I am today. You know what I mean? A guy that could cover the ring, a guy that could move around, a guy that could sell and take good bumps and all that stuff. You know what I mean? 40's just around the corner for me too. So. Happy, happy early birthday, yeah, man. Thank you. How, do you, feel, how do you feel about it? I feel it? really good about it. And you know, I, I've told you this off camera, but my goal is to be in the best shape of my life when I turn 40 on May 19th. And I'm, I'm well on my way now. And I think that the really interesting thing is for so many people in their 30s and I guess in their 40s as well, it's just like downhill. It's like, well, you know, this year's not going to be as good as last year. Or I, oh, I gained five pounds in the last year, probably five more next year. And it just kind of keeps adding on. But for me, I'm all about like focused on this goal. I always say vague goals get vague results, but I'm so focused on like, I want to be in my best shape at 40, then subsequently my best shape at 50 and then so on and so on. I like that you said that because I used to always have the mindset in my early 30s and stuff that like, oh, I'm never going to be better at 40 because I'm 40 and yeah. I now I've aged another 10 years. But now when you get to 40 and also like, again, when you look at some of the guys, like some of my peers, some of the guys, you know what I mean, that you've even interviewed, like there is a formula for being your best at your 40s, but it depends on you doing the right stuff, you know, and not doing the wrong stuff and taking care of yourself and eating right and training, you know what I yeah. mean? Whether it be, you know, the, the weights or cardiovascular conditioning, all of that stuff. So like, you know, I look at a lot of my peers for inspiration on that. You know what I mean? Like we've talked about, you know, Bobby Lashley, Carlito, all those guys. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I also just realized that I was wrong. You know what I mean? Cause I look at myself now and you know, if you looked at the 32 year old me looked at the 40 year old me, he'd be like, Oh shoot, you're actually, <laughs> I think you might be better than <laughs> yeah. like you did something to uh, improve at least uh, from my, my standpoint. So, um, I look even outside of wrestling, like look at the shape that Tom Brady is in at 45. Look at the shape that Tim McGraw's in, in his fifties, Brad Pitt, I believe is 58. George Clooney's a few years uh, older than him. Like, they look amazing. They're getting better with age every year. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we're in L.A., so to clarify, we're not just talking about people who are doing the uh, plastic surgery and all that stuff. Because right. I'm, I'm pretty anti. At least there's way too much of that going on. But, like, yeah, like, no, there's a formula. There's a formula for this. And, like, all the guys you just said, like, you know what I mean? And it's just – it literally is just about figuring out, um, you know, again, like, I feel like the – like, not that, it, again, it was a point, but I – that I wanted to make, but like to not drink will provide me longevity as far as my youth. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I can only imagine that if I was drinking every day, you know, these lines would be a little deeper. I, this face would be sagging a little. I mean, even when I look at myself, there are some pictures that I look at myself in my twenties and when I was big and stuff, but I was also abusing opiates and muscle relaxers and my face looks older 
than it does at 40. Mm. So, I mean, that's some of the stuff I refer to. I'll see old stuff of myself and I'm like, oh yeah, your body looks great. You know, you're big and you're vascular, but man, your face is just like, you know, you, but you're also on the road so much at that point. Sure. But like that kind of stuff, like what you ingest in your body, whether it be alcohol, pills, any, any of that stuff. I mean, food, yeah. It, yeah, it all, it has a toll, you know yeah. what I mean? And it will show through, you are what you eat. Yeah, so much of this for me has been getting rid of processed foods like that. And, and it, the big buzzword right now is seed oils. But you, you dig into that just a little bit and you're like, oh, my gosh. Like, of course, we have so much inflammation when there's safflower oil and sunflower oil. And I don't want to go way down and way off topic here. But Well, you're not, in, Can you're not in Canada anymore. I know you guys' food expectations is much higher out there. I had to hear from my ex. <laughs> hey, but you guys are also serving like... 10% of the American it's true. population. It's true. So <laughs> not to get into the whole <laughs> America Canada thing, but um, yeah, I hear you on the diet. We talked about your debut last time and you were you know, t telling the story about how like you had major food poisoning. One of the really big things, one of the standout moments of your WWE debut is you're in the ring with Stevie Richards and <laughs> you clock him right in the face and you break his nose. Yeah. What did that conversation look like backstage? Oh, there was no conversation. Like, Stevie was uh, enraged, and rightfully so, man. Like, he had already gone his clock cleaned, I think, by Heidenreich, maybe not too long before that. But, I mean, this particular case was awful. And I still look back at it, and there's no good excuse. Like, I can't. It was the Polish hammer right to the face, right? Yeah, like when it comes to me and the Polish hammer, it's just no bueno. Just don't do it. You know what I mean? Like, because I even tried to bring it back in Poland against Nick Aldis. And I'm ashamed to say it, but I actually caught Nick. Not as bad as Stevie. But like, so like basically the Polish hammer is done. I've retired my Polish hammer. But the Stevie instance was, it was awful, man. It was just, think about it. Like, I always look back at that and it's my debut. Yeah, it's my debut on Raw, and this is a guy—not just a guy who got an opportunity. This is a guy, a lifelong fan who understands the relevance, understands the magnitude, how big it is, and like, and you know, you have food poisoning. The worst, like, I never even had food poisoning. Honestly, I didn't know what was going on, and it was just awful. I never had that kind of food poisoning since. And then you culminate it with breaking a guy's nose and orbital bone. Like, and I didn't know this at the time, but I knew it was bad. You know, like it just, you know, I remember some people trying to say, oh, it'll make your debut look good. You know, your this guy's bleeding in the master lot. But I'm like, you know, all it does is make everybody afraid to work you really, you know, yeah. like, like the worst thing in the professional wrestling business, even beyond a bad worker is a big clumsy guy who is dangerous. And like, that's the, that, that is the absolute worst reputation. You do not want that because nobody wants to wrestle that guy. You know what I mean? you rather wrestle the guy who's a shitty worker than wrestle the big clumsy guy. You know what I mean? Because that's a long day at the office. You don't know he, there's going to be stuff misplaced, and somebody might get yeah. hurt. So anyways, I was really – I didn't want that reputation because I already knew that. So, like, I just knew that once I hurt Stevie – and, like, Stevie, I, I don't know if – I'm pretty sure he yelled at me, but, you know – with time, I mean, he knew that I didn't have malicious intentions. I, there's no way I would do that to somebody on purpose ever, especially like I respected all of those guys yeah. upon entry. They might not have known it or seen it because they looked at me like this dumb shit, you know, 19 year old who's 270 pounds about to get a push, but like I respected everybody. I was a, a boy amongst men in a locker room at that point. You know what I mean? All men that I looked up to. So it was like, you know, the, the whole thing sucked, but. Um, <laughs> Are you walking to the back going, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to get fired? I didn't think that. I just knew, gosh, I just knew when I saw him and so enraged, I just knew. I just, but like, you got to understand too, I'm sick as a dog. So, I mean, like, I can't even tell you what I was thinking. I can't remember, I can't remember anything post match. I, the only thing I remember post match was when I got to the back, I remember seeing Stevie kind of storming and walking and he was enraged and he was yelling something. And again, Stevie, you had every right. So I'm <laughs> at his number. You should call him after this and make it. Well, you know what? He wouldn't want to hear it. Cause every time I've seen him since, and we're talking now 20 years, I always apologize for him still. <laughs> and so I'm sure even he at this point is uh, sick of hearing that. And uh, by the way, if we're talking about Stevie this yeah. much, if you've seen his Instagram, I want to wish him, uh, you know, a speedy recovery. I know yeah. he's going through a lot and, and taking us on his journey, but um, I think he's going to be all right. Yeah, wishing him a speedy recovery. He's, he, you're right. He's dealing with a lot here. 
And I appreciate that. He's he, a good dude, man. He's, he's a good dude. such a good dude. And I love that he's allowing us to kind of see the whole progress of what's happening and, and the recovery that he's making. So, yeah, wishing you a speedy recovery, Stevie. What's one thing in the ring that hurt but looked like it didn't hurt? Like, was there a, a moment or a move or a, a, some sort of a, a, a segment that was just should have been a normal move and ended up hurting a lot? Well, that's a tough question. But what I will kind of defer to, and I hope we didn't talk about this already in the last one, is uh, um, HBK slaps. Are Did we talk about this? No. In Oh, yeah. Well, for those of you who don't know, and I, I can say this, everybody knows I'm a huge HBK mark, but HBK has the deadly, the deadliest slaps in the business because he knocked me loopy, he knocked Randy Orton loopy, he knocked Muhammad Hassan loopy with his slap. I mean, all three of us saw stars, I think, in the exact... And, like, it's not to say everybody knows a slap hurts, but you don't... You wouldn't expect HBK to knock you out with a slap, essentially. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. That's the first thing that kind of popped in the mind. Because, uh, again, like, again, you expect the slap to hurt, but you don't expect to see be seeing stars. Because I remember when he slapped me, it was to start wow. our... Well, it was to start our angle, too. So he's, he's like, what do you say? I know what you want. Let's do this. And then he walks up and he slaps me. And, like, literally, I'm, like, seeing, you know, stars. I don't, like, I'm going on instincts. And, like, the next thing was we're trade-off, trade-off, trade-off. You know, uh, sh I shoot him, reverse. He hits me with the gimmick, the flying, uh, you know, forearm, and I powder out. And, uh, man, I was just going on instincts. I mean, luckily, I, I don't even know how you get through those moments, but you do. Because I've heard other, you know, I've heard, I think I heard Taker or somebody talking about this recently. And, like, you know, you get knocked out, and sometimes you, you're just still going, but you're just going on. Oh, uh, yeah. Kurt Angle tells a great story about that. With Brock, right? You know, with uh, uh, the pedigree through the announce table. Oh, yeah. And the announce yeah. table broke. Yeah. And he doesn't remember anything after that. Well, yeah, and then he had to come back in. Yeah, and he did all, yeah, like, it's it's really a trippy thing but like uh yeah i remember i took the flipper and i powdered and when i watch it back it's so funny because i just i completely like oversold the flipper too you know what i mean like i remember i took the bump i rolled the outside and i'm like flopping around the fucking the uh <laughs> the apron outside and stuff i'm like what are you doing man and you're like looks like you're trying to do an impersonation of like hbk's oversells of hulk hogan from the night before <laughs> You know what I mean? Or something like that. Like, you know, who knows? Maybe I was. I'd like, I, and I wasn't even conscious of it. Is HBK the best you've ever been in the ring with? Uh, by far, the, he, he, for me, he was, even to this day, still by far the easiest working experience I've ever had. And not to say I wasn't like nervous working him or anything, but like, there's something about, first of all, when you have, first of all, it goes without saying he's the best in ring guy ever. He's over which is also a very important thing to like have the crowd invest in him. Right. But um, when it's your favorite wrestler, <laughs> there's something like you already know, like, you know, you know what I mean? Like the only thing I remember early on is I was trying, like I was super excited. I was trying to get him to do some of the, like some of the things he did back in his first run. And he's like, Whoa, 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 whoa kid. <laughs> we got to create the illusion of movement. And which, you know, so he, he reined me in and I, I kind of understood like, Oh, okay. So this is why he does it, and this is how he works things. But, like, yeah, it was the easy, easiest experience of my life and the, one of the greatest learning lessons because after I gained his trust after, like, one or two matches, which, by the way, just kind of happened. It was, in a, it was during Raw on a break, and I remember I was taking him into – did I tell you the story in the last no. one? I don't think so. I remember I took Sean, and, and we're in commercial, and I'm going to ram his back into the post. Like, I got him like a body slam, and I can hear I'm running full force. And like, this is only our second time in the ring together, and I can hear the fear in his voice. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And like, really last second, I put my hand in between his back and the post, so he didn't get any of it. If anything, my hand took all of it. And I always feel like that was one of the moments where he, at least he trusted, okay, the kid won't kill me. Mm. And then we worked a live event, and it was our first live event, and the match was okay. Like, it felt okay, but I just remember after he had this confidence, he's like, whoa, kid, if that's the worst uh, you got for me, then we're going to be all right. Mm. And then from that point on, he just let me call all the matches, which, you know, when you're a 20-year-old, I mean, you're a 20-year-old kid calling the matches against your favorite all-time wrestler growing up. It was just like, everything was phrased in a question. I couldn't help it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just like, duck one, baseball slide, uh, I don't know, chop, <laughs> chop, you know? So anyways, but like, it was amazing. Oh, well, to bring this back full circle here, I appreciate that I'm playing a 
very small role in you getting a shot at the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. And it's like, what, a month away right now? Yeah, April 7th, uh, NWA 312. That's going to be in Chicago, Chi Town, big wrestling town. I'm sure, you know, Chicago, honestly, I'm sure you probably know this, but Chicago is one of the prime wrestling cities yes. in all of the country. And I, going back all the way to uh, WrestleMania, what was it, um, 22, where uh, me and Carlito opened the show, man, just a uh, electric crowd. And I know that we're going to have a lot of hardcore, like passionate wrestling fans there i'm sure uh you know billy corgan probably is going to draw a lot of that uh, you know it's billy's hometown too as yeah, well billy so, lives there yeah yeah so i mean it's this is going to be a big deal and uh, obviously it's a big deal for me and uh yeah i think i appreciate uh your part in this man i, I feel like i should be there so yeah. I, I will see you there yeah i think you might have to come down okay well there <laughs> it is thank you for making this happen again and, hey, I'm so excited about this match with you and Tyrus. Yeah, yeah, me too. I'll come back in another two months. How about that? <laughs> Just do this every two months. Sounds great. Appreciate you, man. All right, man.